Hi everyone, welcome to episode 24 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Paul Bassett, the co-founder of Seek, one of Australia's most successful companies to date with a market cap of close to $5 billion. Paul is also the co-founder of SquarePay Capital, one of the premier venture capital firms in Australia. Along with these roles, Paul is also a non-executive director at Wes Farmers, director of Innovation Australia and on the AFL Commission. In the interview, Paul shares his insights on the team dynamics that he looks for, why good businesses focus on solving problems and the importance of attracting high quality talent. Without further ado, here is my interview with Paul Bassett. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Thank you. Looking forward to it. So for those few people that may not have uh, not be as familiar with you and your background, can you share a little bit of your story of, of uh, how you started and, and where you are today? Sure. Um, I started my career. I studied uh, law commerce at Melbourne Uni uh, and then spent six years working as a lawyer on, on corporate and commercial transactions. Uh, then in 1997, um, I co-founded Seek uh, with my brother Andrew and third co-founder Matt Rockman and then spent 14 years at Seek from 1997 to 2011. Um, we were focused initially on the online employment market in Australia and New Zealand and then over time that grew to a range of other geographies including China, Brazil, Mexico, Southeast Asia as well as vocational education and training. Uh, In 2011, I I left Seek and took a six-month sabbatical. And then um, in 2012, I co-founded SquarePeg. Um, We invest in early-stage technology companies in Australia and New Zealand, Southeast Asia and Israel are the primary geographies we're focused on. Um, And as well as that, I'm a non-executive director of West Farmers, uh, a director of Innovation Australia, and on the AFL Commission. Sure. So um, I guess just going back to, to the start of your career, what, um, what kind of instigated you to leave your career in law to, to starting your own business? Yeah, I think there are a few different things that happened together. So um, in, in about 1995, um, I started acting for LookSmart, which was co-founded by um, Evan Thornley and Tracy Ellery. And Evan had been a friend of mine um, from university days and... He came to me and said uh, he was setting up an internet company with his wife, Tracy, and they're looking for some legal advice. And um, I knew nothing about the internet at that point. And so I guess that was my first introduction to the internet. And then had the idea one day, a couple of years later, to do um, an online classified site. Originally, actually, real estate was the idea. Although before we got started, we decided jobs was, was, was the market that we'd focus on. And um, I guess sort of learning about the internet and seeing the opportunities and the new business models emerge on the internet kind of, I guess, indirectly was the inspiration for the idea. And soon after having the idea, I, um, I chatted to my brother Andrew about it. And over the next four or five months, we, uh, we, we went through a business plan phase and we, we looked at the opportunity and we looked at the idea and whether, whether it was worth pursuing and we were really, really excited about it. Um, and then at that point, we, we, that's when we, um, uh, Matt Rockman got involved and his father, Irvin, uh, who were the original investors in Seek. Sure. And so you mentioned um, that you were originally looking at real estate and then mm. moved into the, to the job classified space. What, um, what made you kind of shift that, that focus? Oh, look, I think there are a few things. I mean, firstly, you know, as it's turned out, realestate.com that I use has been enormously, enormously successful. So that's obviously a, ter- you know, a, really, a really fantastic market as well as the jobs market. Uh, at the time, we felt that the employment market was probably a little bit more inefficient than the real estate market was. And therefore, the role of a, of a marketplace or the role of an intermediary was even more important in jobs than it was in real estate. Uh, was, was, I guess, the first factor. And secondly, there was a little bit of a concern given how big the big franchise players um, in Australia, such as Ray White, are and how big a share of the market they have. That, we felt, presented a little bit of a risk for, for someone trying to build up a new emerging marketplace. Sure. And so you, you then had the, the concept and, and the team around you that, that originally kind of wanted to, to get the idea off the ground. What did those first few steps look like in, in taking the concept and then turning that into a business? Back yeah, then? look, the first thing was, um, you know, we, you know, as I, as I mentioned, there was that sort of six month period, five, six month period where Andrew and I were doing the business plan. And then once we got started, 
in November 1997, you know, the first and primary goal was obviously building the website, and um, which was, you know, not an overly complex process, but certainly a lot more complicated back in 1997 than it was now. And, and we didn't have strong technology backgrounds. Andrew had studied computer science, so did have some background understanding, but certainly with Matt and I, no background in, in, in technology. Uh, so first and foremost, well, the first and foremost was, um, was, was building a website. And then I guess at the same time, trying to build both <clears throat> advertiser relationships with recruitment firms particularly, but also corporates, um, and also attract job seekers to the website. And then of course, it's really difficult because simil- you, know, you want to attract the job seekers to the website, but they're only going to come if there's, a- if there's job ads there to view. And similarly, from an employer or recruitment firm perspective, um, they don't want to advertise unless they're going to get results and you need a lot of job seekers to get great results. And so we had to sort of simultaneously build both sides of the equation, which is obviously very complicated in a marketplace business, business, but that was very much the focus in the initial period. Sure. Um, in terms of, uh, obviously the ecosystem's kind of changed a lot between when Seek first started to, to what it's like now. Can you kind of talk a little bit about um, what some of those changes are? Yeah, look, I think there's, there's certainly, um, at that time, there really wasn't much in the way of accelerators and incubators, number one. So we've seen a real proliferation in, in that market in the, in, in the last few years, which is obviously a really, really welcome change. There were some sources of early stage funding, but, but not much. So again, we've probably more funding sources today than there were. This, we certainly need more of those um, as a community. Um, and I think just the, the, the general community focus, the broad community focus on the importance of innovation and fostering startups, which is, I think, very much part of the debate in Australia today, that really wasn't part of the debate in, in Australia at the time in any way, in, to anywhere near the same extent. Sure. And so I guess fast forward uh, a few years to, to starting SquarePeg. Yeah. Um, why, why initially kind of take that step from, uh, from being at Seek and, and being a really successful company to then launching uh, your own fund? Sure, look, I think if, uh, at a personal level, it, was, it felt like it was a good time for me to, to move from Seek to do something different. Um, it had been an extraordinary 14 years. I'd, I'd loved every minute of it, but it felt like it was, it was a good time for a change. I think, you know, I was... I continued to be incredibly passionate about the people and about the business, but probably wasn't as passionate about the role as I had been. And so on that basis, I decided it was time to do something new. And, um, and after taking that, that sabbatical, um, Square Peg was born. That was through a series of conversations with, with, um, with, with Tony Holt, who was a long-standing friend of mine uh, that I'd gone through school and university with, uh, with Justin Liberman and Barry Brott. And again, I'd known them for a long, long time. And Justin was an early investor in Seek going back now 17 years or so. And so we sat down and we had a conversation about uh, setting up Square Peg. Um, it went through some iterations, but essentially it was, you know, the focus was to invest in early stage technology companies, both here in Australia and in other markets. Sure. And so what specifically is it that Square Peg looks for in, in investment opportunities? The, the first thing we look at is what is the problem being solved? Um, is, is it an important problem? Um, is it a, a big problem? Um, how did the founders come about solving the particular problem they were solving. So what's the problem being solved? Um, secondly, how is it being solved? Um, <clears throat> people don't typically move, whether it's consumers or businesses, they don't typically move <clears throat> from one way of doing things to a new way, from an incumbent way to a disruptive way, <clears throat> unless the new method or service is significantly better. Call that order of magnitude better. So how is the problem being solved? Is it significantly better than the current way of solving the problem. And on top of that, um, is, it, um, um, uh, is it being solved in a unique and differentiated way? Or is it being solved in a way that's easy for other people to copy? The next factor we look at is when is the problem being solved? Um, with the emergence of early stage businesses, timing is really, really important. Usually there's a particular catalyst. So in the case of Seek, the obvious catalyst was the emergence of the internet which provided the opportunity for a better way for job seekers to find jobs and for employers and recruitment firms to find staff than was the case in the traditional print classifieds. So what's the catalyst for this particular business that we're, that we're looking at? All of those factors are very, very important. But of course, the factor that is most important of all is who is the people solving the problem? Who is solving the problem? Um, 
and, and spending a lot of time with the team and getting to know them, uh, the founders, um, other key members of, of the management team, um, their hunger, uh, their passion and energy, um, uh, their ability to, to execute on the business model, the, the judgments around their ability to scale with the business as it grows. And so that's the single most important thing we're focusing on, which is, which is the team and, and their capability. Sure. Um, in, in terms of the, the team dynamics, is there anything specifically, so you mentioned, um, I guess, more kind of personality traits that, that, you, that you look for. Is there anything in terms of the dynamics between the individual members of the team or, or the cohesiveness that, that you look for? Yeah, look, it's really, really important. I mean, number one, first and foremost, the key, the cohesiveness is incredibly important. And again, we're making judgments about what we see over a period of time. But it's really interesting to see the way in which, the, the fa- assuming there are multiple founders, the founders interact with each other. Um, are there already some signs of tension? Are they aligned in terms of their vision of the business? So, for example, one, one founder is kind of really, really focused on how do we build a business that sustains for the next 20 years? And, for example, another founder kind of wants to build a, a good business, do it quickly, and then exit and move on. That, for example, is going to you know, uh, present opportunities for tension between them going forward. So the cohesion between them is really important. The other thing is, is how complementary are the skill sets? Um, one of the things that truthfully we see often in founders is they often come from similar backgrounds. They might have studied together, they might have worked together. And, and whilst that's really terrific in terms of the fact that they know each other and they bring together a history of, of working together or they might be family members, etc. Um, if you can also have complementary backgrounds and experiences and particularly skill sets, that's enormously valuable. So for example, a... Um, you know, a founder with a, you know, let's say, for example, as a business that's focused on, on, on selling something to the enterprise, a founder with a strong enterprise sales background and, and another founder with a strong technology background, other things being equal, is probably going to be better than two founders with a technology background or two founders with a sales background. Sure. And so you mentioned uh, earlier that SquarePeg sort of invests in companies all over the world, specifically US, Israel and, and Australia. What are some of the, the differences that you see between um, some of the problems being solved or some of the founding teams in between those different regions? Yeah, look, you know, we, we're seeing, if we, if we look at our focused geographies, um, in Australia we've had a number of marketplace businesses emerge over the last 10 or 15 years, both large domestic marketplaces like real estate, car sales and seek that have then expanded to become significant offshore businesses as well as local businesses. Um, but we've also seen businesses that are day one started as sort of focused on a sort of a, a specific niche global marketplace opportunity. Um, and a business like Envato uh, is similar to that or a business like Freelancer.com. So we tend to have done well in that. Um, a lot of the founders come from business backgrounds, more so than software backgrounds. Again, enormous number of exceptions to that. Scott and Mike and Atlassian are obviously a, a really important exception to that. Um, I think one of the other challenges with Australian startups is we're not a massive global market such as the US where you can, you know, just by focusing on purely on the domestic market, you have, can build a very, very large scale, scale business. Nor are we a very small market like New Zealand or Israel. And so sometimes founders can fall into the trap, and it's not always a trap, but it can be a trap of focusing on the Australian market rather than focusing on global opportunities. And, and typically we're trying to, you know, we're encouraging founders or look, are generally most focused on businesses that are focused on a particular global opportunity and doing something unique and special on a global basis, not just a local basis. Um, if we look at Israel, um, obviously very, very deep and strong technology routes um, in, in, in software and in te- telecommunications. Um, we're seeing far more consumer Inter- consumer mobile and consumer internet businesses emerged than was the case 10 or 15 years ago. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of the businesses have a really, really strong technology differentiation. Um, and that often is a source of competitive advantage for the Israeli businesses. Um, one of the changes we're seeing in Israel in the last five or 10 years is they're increasingly focused on building large global scale businesses and, and a business like Mobile Eye which focuses on the automotive market, is a really good example of that, rather than building businesses and, and then selling them after two, three, four, five years to, to major technology companies such as, as Intel or Microsoft or, or Apple. Um, <clears throat> Southeast Asia is another market that we're, we're really heavily focused on. And what we're typically seeing in Southeast Asia is pan-regional plays. 
uh, market uh, businesses that are focused on the Southeast Asian region, typically rather than rather than uh, global opportunities, and and you know often they are business models that we have seen emerge in other markets, but but the real skill and real expertise in a lot of those markets is making a business model work. For example, in in, in Singapore with its five million people, very very educated workforce, very very high GDP per capita. And Indonesia, for example, with a population of over 200 million people with a much lower income per capita, very, very different culturally, very different stages of evolution. So how do you successfully execute a business model across Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, and so on? And that's often a big part of the challenge of these businesses. And we're often looking to back entrepreneurs that have the capability to execute across multiple markets that have very, very different dynamics. Sure. Um, I mean, speaking of multiple markets, um, you touched on sort of Australian founders focusing on, on the regional aspect rather than on a global, um, rather than having a global focus. What At what stage do you think that um, startups should be thinking globally? Um, is that something that they should do from, from day one or something that they should try and aim to, to win locally first before they... Um, I think typically, again, there's no particular rule, but typically we like to see founders focusing on, on solving problems globally on day one. And there's a few different reasons for that. Firstly, if it is just a local market, is the market going to be big enough to sustain a very large, very significant business? And for us, our focus is very much to try to invest in businesses where the entrepreneurs, if they're successful, can build really large-scale businesses. Now, there are certainly plenty of domestic markets that, that can, can present um, large uh, opportunities and financial, in financial services, there's lots of large domestic opportunities. Um, but the other thing about focusing locally rather than globally is, you know, <clears throat> is the problem you're, going to, you're trying to solve, is that going to be solved on a local basis or a global basis? And so, for example, you know, if you were building a search engine in the late 1990s and you were just focused on the Australian market, you know, and we saw a number of those players emerge in that period when we started Seek, um, the reality is, is that you are inevitably going to be beaten by global players <clears throat> because of the scale, expertise, investment required to build a successful search business. And so if you're focused just on a local market, I think the questions you have to ask yourself is, do I think there's a significantly big opportunity here? But more fundamentally than that, is this a market where a local player actually has inherent advantages over global players? And again, financial services, because of the rules and regulations um, and the nature of those markets, is a market well, that might often, in a lot of cases, be won by local rather than global players. But a lot of other cases, typically the global players may have significant advantages. So if you are just focused locally, you may end up losing to someone who has the scale and expertise and horsepower to operate on a much broader market basis. Sure. Um, I, I guess from some of the, the private discussions that I've had with other investors, with other members of, of people from the ecosystem, one of the things that, that kind of comes out is... Um, Perhaps Australian founders aren't focusing on big enough problems. Um, a, I was wondering if you if you share that sentiment, can, uh, you know, considering that, that you invest in, in different um, different regions around the world, and if so, why do you think that that is? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, my, my first reaction is yes, we don't focus on big enough problems, but but if you look at the success, if you look at the success of some of the largest companies that have emerged over the last 10 or 15, 20 years, they have in some cases focused on a, initially on a very specific problem. Um, in some cases, a relatively narrow problem. And the business has grown enormously and it's been a, a solution that has been easy to scale. But they've, they've focused on something and done it really, really well in the initial period. Um, so PayPal, for example, the main use case initially for PayPal when it was founded was to facilitate payments on eBay. And that certainly wasn't the sum total of the vision of the founders, but they wanted to really, really solve that problem very, very effectively and, and then, scale, then scale from there. You know, Facebook, again, started out as a social media network for a single university campus, Harvard. Now, the time period from going from there to other camp, uh, colleges around the US and then opening up more broadly to US users and global users was, was a fairly short period of time. And so um, I think... Part of the answer lies in, you know, how well are you solving the problem? Doing a really, really good job of solving a specific problem is much better 
much better than doing a pretty average job of solving a broad, a much larger, a broader problem. But, but equally, it's really important that the problem you're solving is capable of scaling in, into other opportunities over a short period of time. Sure. And, I mean, obviously, um, through, through all of your, the time that you've spent in, in the ecosystem um, playing various roles, um, what are some of the, the commonalities that you're seeing between um, successful founders and uh, perhaps unsuccessful founders as well? Look, a lot of it is a lot of it is just in capability and mindset. Um, one of the things that, that you know the successful founders have is is um, very very high levels of energy and drive and passion. They're really focused on on, on the problem they're trying to solve. So they're not focused on um, how do we um, how do we drive as much revenue from our customers as we can, or how do we sell this business for as much as we possibly can as quickly as we possibly can. They're really, really focused on the problem they're solving and they're delivering outstanding outcomes to their, um, uh, to their, to their customers, whether they're business customers or whether they're consumers, um, is, is number one. And we see that over and over and over again. Uh, I think the other thing about it is, is, is a sort of a curiosity um, and an ability to scale. And so knowing what you don't know is incredibly important in an early stage business. There's no rule book or there's no template uh, there are people, obviously, who you can go to and ask and get help with questions. But having that ability to sort of know what you don't know, to continue to bring in stronger and stronger people in the organisation, to really build out the organisational capability, they're traits that we see over and over again. Um, as you try to scale a business, those sorts of skills are much more important than being um, a great software engineer or being a great salesperson. So in the early stages of your business, maybe being a great salesperson may be very, very important because you might be personally responsible for <clears throat> bringing most of the large enterprise customers, but that can only scale so far. And so the ability to build a strong management team, build a strong sales organisation, build a strong technology and product organisation, having those leadership skills, um, um, having that ability to hire really, really strong people is much more important than being a strong software engineer or, str or a strong salesperson. Sure. And, and on that, um, I'm wondering whether, from your perspective, um, whether looking at uh, investment opportunities changes slightly from more seed and, and early stage startup investment to later stage, where you know you have a team, you have mm. essentially product market fit. Are there different things that, that you're looking for? Yeah, look, to some extent, yes. And I think that's by definition, because there's only so much you can look at in a seed stage business. So what can you look at with a seed stage business? Usually it's just the founders. There might be one or two others in there, but it's usually just the founders and a very, very small team um, and the problem they're solving. So one of the things we try to understand is how are they going about solving that problem and, and how did they discover that problem in the first place? And so, you know, often understanding how the founders discover that problem gives us a good insight into, into really whether or not it's a real problem they're solving or whether it's a solution looking for a problem. And so the focus is, is, is on the founders, um, focuses on, on the problem being solved and how they're going to go about solving it and making a judgment call about their ability to execute. Of course, with a Series A opportunity or, or even more so a Series B, etc., all those factors I talked about are important. But you can actually look at, there is actually evidence of how they're going about solving the problem. And so the numbers and traction are important, but they're not the be-all and end-all. But it's also actually looking at them over a period of time and looking about how, they, how they're going about building that organisation, how they're going about build, hiring a team, leading a team, looking after the customers, what the level of customer satisfaction is like. Um, are, are they doing a good job of attracting customers, but, but most of them are churning? Or are their customers really, really happy with what's doing? So it's a much broader set of things that we're able to look at with, a, with, a, with more of a Series A or Series B opportunity than there is in a seed stage. Sure. And uh, again, I guess, coming, coming back to the ecosystem, what would you like to see more of in, in Australia in terms of founding members or mm. teams or, or ideas? Look, we need more of everything. We need more great founders. Um, we need more people who have the... Um, capability and, and energy um, that, that become part of these early the management teams, their businesses. We need more software engineers. We may need more designers. We need more product managers. We need more accelerators and incubators. We need more capital. We need supportive government policies. 
And all of those things are really, really important. But, but of course, the ingredient that is most important of all is, is more and more of the best and brightest in our, in our community deciding to start technology companies to found, to, to leave what they're doing, often safe and secure jobs, and, and taking the risk, but with the potential you know, rewards and, 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 and great sense of um, fulfilment that can come out of building something out of nothing. Sure. It, on that, is, is there anything that you think can help instigate that? Oh, look, I think there's a few things. I think, I, I think you know, government can be helpful in terms of having supported policies, and I think we're absolutely moving in the right direction. Um, I think um, uh, gearing our, uni- our, our school and university system so that we are producing more people with STEM skill- skills. Um, the reality is, is most important problems in the world today are being solved by software and therefore it's really, really important we reorient our education system towards more of those, of those sorts of skills in, in the broader sense of the word. Um, and then also really in the same way that our great sports people are national heroes. I'd love us to see um, founders of, of companies and some of the people who have built fantastic businesses in Australia in the last 10 or 15 years um, get that same recognition that, as, as our fantastic sports people get. Sure. And, uh, and finally, um, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of kind of looking forward, are there any particular verticals or, or streams that are kind of really... Um, interesting to you as as investment opportunities oh look we're seeing you know we're we're seeing lots of interesting things in 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 a whole range of different areas um you know the the um developments we're seeing in machine learning after you know this being a technology that's been around for generations but you know there's probably been more things happen in the machine learning area in the last two or three years in the last 40 or 50 years um businesses um related to that businesses that have data at their core and solving data problems for businesses or consumers are, are really, really important. Uh, we're seeing huge changes in the whole transport and automotive sector. Uh, we're obviously with, with, with ride-sharing businesses, the emergence of um, um, uh, electric cars, and most fundamentally, the emergence of autonomous vehicles, which in turn rely so much on machine learning. And, and that in turn is going to spawn so many other spin-off implications uh, in terms of business opportunities um, in a whole range of different um, verticals, uh, vertical markets. We're seeing um, cloud-based software solutions um, take over from, from traditional software models. Uh, we're seeing the emergence of a really new and exciting um, marketplace businesses particularly in, in, within the gig economy or freelance type marketplaces. Um, wearable technology is another area where we're seeing significant change. Um, and Internet of Things is obviously going to play a, a, a really, really important role way beyond impo- uh, wearable technology and also particularly in relation to, to government and enterprise applications. So there's no shortage of things for us to get excited about. Sure. And so for anyone that wants to reach out, get in touch, follow you or, or SquarePeg, what's the best way for them? To yeah, look, they should. I think first and foremost, if you can find a warm lead, someone in your network who knows us, that certainly is the best way. Because if someone who, who we know and trust is prepared to refer or recommend you, that certainly comes with a bit more weight. Um, but obviously, people are welcome via the website to submit their, their business plan. Um, we're keen to see great ideas. We see a lot, a lot of opportunities a year. We can obviously only invest in a relatively small portion of proportion of those opportunities. Um, but for those businesses where, for one reason or another, we don't end up investing, we obviously try to help those entrepreneurs as much as we can, either by making other introductions or trying to give them some advice or suggestions. So we welcome we welcome approaches. But but if you can do it through a warm lead, that is obviously going to give you the best possible chance of. Of, uh, of a good outcome and that's the case with us and really any other venture fund. Fantastic. Paul, thank you so much for your, for your time and sharing your insights today. That's been extremely valuable. Thanks, Ryan. Enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to episode 24 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Paul along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Next week, I interview Alan Jones. Alan is a startup evangelist at Blue Chili, an angel investor, and a founding investor in Startmate and Blackbird Ventures. In the interview, Alan shares his insights on understanding customer intent, 
the ingredients of a good startup team, and the need to hack diversity. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 25 next week.